right, now let's get our Bibles and let's go to Acts chapter 24. Acts chapter 24. If you don't have a Bible, raise your hand and we will get one to you. And that is super important tonight. How many of you guys here remember when we did Wednesday nights? Okay, you remember the Wednesday nights? Remember when I did an entire chapter every Wednesday night? I'm going to do that tonight. Yeah. Never mind, I eat 10 o'clock. You the kind, you devote the game out, so I'm not going to tell you who won. All right, so you got that, the kind, you, you're filming it, so it's all good. All right, so you got, everybody got your Bibles, because we're going to do chapter 24. Yeah, yeah all right, because you know what, it's one continuous beautiful story, and I'm going to read it, explain it, and then we're going to take it apart. Allah, Heavenly Father, thank you that we can come and we can actually just pull it to God. How crazy is that? I'm standing here communicating with the God who said, let there be light. The God who said, Father, forgive them. They know not what they do. The God who said, it is finished. The God that walked into that room alive after resurrection and said, peace be with you. That's the God who's here right now. And so, Lord, stir us up. I confess, today's message is maybe a little bit more on the conviction side. Not always easy to hear, not always easy to teach, but Lord, it is always necessary. And so Lord, stir us up. Where we need encouragement today, encourage us. Where we need correction, correct us. But Lord, may we, just be, tr may we be transformed, not just informed. We don't need another sermon. Lord, what we need is to be more like you so we can lead more people to you. So God, come right now and allow me and all of us to decrease and you increase in us. Teach us now. We're listening. In your name we pray. Amen. Okay, well, if you remember, I told you, Paul, going from one bad situation to another bad situation, there's the plot to kill him. They take him down to Caesarea, and where does Paul end up staying? An incredible beach house. Okay, so God is large, and Okay, so here he is chillaxing in this beautiful thing, and that's what we're picking up now in chapter 24, verse 1. And it says this, And after five days, the high priest Ananias came down with some of the elders, with a certain attorney named Tertullius, and they brought charges to the governor against Paul. And after Paul had been summoned, Tertullius began to accuse him, saying to the governor, Since we have through you attend, <laughs> attained much peace, and since by your providence and reform are being carried out through the nation, we acknowledge this in every way and everywhere, most excellent Felix, with all thankfulness. Right then there, if you were sitting in the crowd, you would have gone, <coughs> this is the Jewish attorney saying, oh, pagan grueler Felix, who I'll talk about later, since you're doing so many awesome things for the community and you're so awesome, listen, folks, all they did is hate this man. All he did was persecute the Jewish people, and here they come in, totally blowing smoke, doing what, <clears throat> don't shoot at me any attorneys, what attorneys do best, and he's, he's, he's building all this you know, relationship with them by trying to, you know, like, oh, sock up to him. And so we acknowledge, verse 3, in the every way and everywhere, most excellent Felix. And so he, he, he basically butters him up, verse 4, but that I may not weary you any further. Isn't it funny? Nothing's changed. I beg you to grant us by your loving kindness a brief hearing. For we have found this man a real pest and a fellow who stirs up dissension amongst the Jews throughout the world and a ringleader of the sect of the Nazarenes. Now, when he, why would he say the sect of the Nazarenes? What have I taught you about Nazareth at this point in time? About 175 people. It was a migrant work camp. Translation, this guy is a real redneck hillbilly. So everything, most excellent Felix, you know, we got this little redneck. Can we just take him out back and shoot him? That's really where he's going with this, okay? The sect of the Nazarenes. Then it goes on to say, and he even tried to desecrate the temple. This guy's nothing but trouble. And then we arrested him. 
Now, some of your versions will have um, verse 7 that will say, But Lysias the commander came along with much violence and took him out of our hands, ordering us to bring him to his accusers. Now, verse 8, By examining him yourself concerning all these matters, you will be able to ascertain the things which, which we accuse him. And the Jews also joined in the attack, asserting that these things were so. And when the governor had nodded for him to speak, Paul responded. So, here we have this guy coming in, this attorney. He comes in, he brings all of his stuff, says all these things about Paul. And after buttering up Felix, and now Paul responds. So you can just put right here, and you know, and then now Paul responds in verse 10. Knowing that for years you have been a judge to this nation, I cheerfully make my defense. Meaning... I'm glad I'm talking to somebody with some clout and authority because I've been dealing with a whole lot of people who haven't. Now he says this, verse 11, since you can take note of, what does it say? The fact. So I'm going to talk about that a little bit later on. But you can take note of the fact that no more than 12 days ago, I went up to Jerusalem to what? To worship. And neither in the temple nor in the synagogues nor in the city itself did they find me carrying on a discussion with anyone or causing a riot. Nor can they, what's the key word there? Prove to you the charges for which they now accuse me. But this I admit to you. Please underline that because I'm going to get back to that. But this I admit to you. That according to the way which they have called a sect, I do serve the God of our fathers, believing everything that is in accordance with the law and what is written in the prophets, having a hope in God, which these men cherish themselves, and that they certainly will be a resurrection of both the righteous and whom? The wicked. And the wicked. In view of this, I also do my best to maintain always a blameless conscience before God and before men. Now after several years, I came to bring alms to my nation and to present. Now he begins to give the facts. Here's what they've said, but here's the facts. This is what happened. Verse 17, after several years, I came down to bring alms to my nation and to present offerings in which they found me occupied in the temple, having been, what's the key word there? Purified. Been purified without any crowd or uproar. But there were certain Jews from Asia. Pause right there. He's saying, I wasn't causing trouble. I was simply worshiping. But the troublemakers, the ones you see standing right over there, I can almost see Paul doing one of these things. I was sitting here worshiping and there was no riot, but certain Jews from Asia... <laughs> You can just see him just leaning in, you know. <clears throat> but these certain Jews from Asia, verse 19, who ought to have been present before you and make an accusation, but they couldn't have anything against me or else let these men themselves tell you what misdeed they have found when I stood before the council. Other than for this one statement, which I... I like this. Shout it out while standing among them for the resurrection of the dead. I am on trial before you. And I'm going to talk about why that's important again. Verse 22. But Felix, having a more exact knowledge about the way, put them off saying, when Lysias, the commander, comes down, I will decide your case. And he gave orders to the centurion for him to be kept in custody. Now check it out. Take him back to the beach house. And yet, have some freedom and do not prevent any of his friends from ministering to him. But some days later, Felix arrived with Drusilla, his wife, who was a Jewess, and sent for Paul. And he heard him speak about faith in Christ Jesus. And he was discussing righteousness, self-control, and the judgment to come. Felix, what happened? What does it say? He became frightened. We're going to talk about that. He became frightened and said, go away for the present. And when I find time, I will summon you. And at the same time, too, he was hoping that some money would be given to him by Paul. Therefore, he also used to send for him quite often and converse with him. <clears throat> Giving him that whole opportunity with the hand down thing. Verse 27. But after two years had passed, Felix was succeeded by Porcius Festus. And wishing to do the, quote, Jews a favor, Felix left Paul imprisoned. I will explain all of that in a moment as well. 
Here we are in this scenario of the next step in this saga of the thing called Paul's life. As Paul is now faithfully, just as I said before, trying to learn it, know it, live it, and express his life, he's here in this beach house, and now all of a sudden they come down, the Sanhedrin comes down with the Johnny Cochran of their day, okay? They bring this high-powered attorney, the guy who's all full of fluff, and notice what he does. He makes all kinds, and if you're taking notes, I want you to notice this, he makes all kinds of eloquent accusations. Christian, look at me. There are going to be people who are going to be very good at accusing you. You know what I'm talking about? Remember I said last week about getting into our face versus Facebook? Yes. You know, people are really good at coming up with. And so Paul, same thing. They give these eloquent accusations, but Paul is going to prove that they are just that. They're just accusations. Family, we have got to learn to let the main thing be the main thing. If you spend all of your time running around putting at fires, you will never have time to start the fires God wants you to start. Am I making sense? We are trying to make everybody like us and everybody this and everybody. In the, and the whole point of the matter is if the enemy can get me from doing good, then I won't be doing God. So well, it's a good thing, right, to make this and this. No, 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 no. You have to understand, is that resolution for you or is it for the kingdom of God? There are times when people have had issue with me and I, and I want to just go and I want to talk and I get this idea that the Lord just says, you know what, that's you seeking closure. But you know what, it's just going to continue because really the pain is in their heart, not yours, and it's just going to fester. Does that make sense? And so we see here Paul doing something. You see, Paul lived a life that all it was was accusations. Look overhead. First Peter tells us this, chapter 2. Keep your behavior excellent among the Gentiles. Now notice, so that the things in which they slander you. Notice it's kind of, this is happening. This will happen. It's not, and so if they do, it's basically when they do. So when they slander you as evildoers, they may on account of your what? Your good deeds, as they observe them, glorify God in the day of visitation. I'm going to talk about why that's so important. We're going to see this as a theme, and maybe even Romans 1.16 today, that I am not ashamed of the gospel. It is the power of salvation to all who believe. Living our lives in such a way and not being ashamed of the gospel. That's what I see in chapter 24. Because they come with all of this eloquence and argument against Paul, but nothing could stick. Why? Because Paul had done nothing wrong. Are you with me? Family, that's how we all need to live our lives. We all need to live our lives innocent before God and man. Now, do we achieve this at all times? Absolutely not. That is why we need to learn these very, very powerful words. Are you ready? This will change the world for Christ. I don't see with your pins out. Ready? Okay. Ready? Write this down. This will change the world. I'm sorry. Why do you bloggers think those things cost so much money? You think that's the $10 million word? I'm sorry. You know, you did, 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 I did? I'm sorry. I'm sorry that that came across that way. You know what? You say you do this and you're a Christian and then you wouldn't do this and you wouldn't check out early. You know, you're right. I did. I'm sorry. That was a bad testimony. Would you forgive me? What are they going to say to that? Oh. They're used to, oh, yeah, what about you when the last week you wouldn't do the kind? <laughs> Amen? Yes. See, the whole point is learning to receive when we've done things wrong. Listen, we need to live our lives in such a way that these things that the world wants to accuse us, we are not guilty of. But I'll tell you what, my sermon today is this. There are things that we need to be guilty of. What I see in this sermon, there are things that Paul said I'm guilty of. Look at verse 14. First thing he says, but this I admit to you. First one, note takers, is I'm guilty of being a follower of the way. I'm guilty of that. I love that early name. That was the coolest name, The Way. You know why they called it The Way? It's because Jesus was the model. He showed them what? The Way. way. And the best part is that Jesus didn't just point to the way, what? He is the way, exactly. He is the way, the truth, and the life. So my question to all of us today is, are you and I eager to be one who is identified as a follower of the way? Let me say it again. 
Are you sitting here today, one who can say, yeah, brother, I am eager to be identified as a follower of the way. Amen. See, that's what we need to ask ourselves. You know, someone once said years ago, it wasn't me, they said, if Christianity became a crime tomorrow, how long would it take for you to be arrested? <laughs> and if they went to your neighbor on the left and your neighbor on the right, could they get any evidence to convict you? Or do they just go, I don't know where they go every Saturday. They just kind of leave and then come back. <laughs> Good for us. We party. We get the parking space. <laughs> I don't know where they go every Sunday. But it's quiet. I can watch football. Maybe that's where they go. Maybe they go football game. I think they got kids. They go football. <laughs> or do they know who your Savior is, who your Lord is? Let me put it in another way. Are you guilty of being perceived as a follower of the way? Or perhaps maybe right now as I'm speaking, there's a sense of guilt of the fact that you know the way, the truth, and the life. And you are saying nothing about that. Is there a sense of guilt there? And listen, I want to respond to all of us. I get it. I get it. We live in some tough times right now in trying to share the gospel. Isn't it crazy how everything is a hot button today? Anything that you say somehow can just set somebody off. It's out of hand. It's crazy. It's so crazy that even the cartoonists are beginning to pick up on it. Check these two that got sent to me, okay? This thing, if you got pearls before, I now check it out. We'll, let's go one by one here. First of all, the guy's watching. He's all, my team is down in the ninth inning. And he's like, well, they say it ain't over till what? <laughs> the fat lady sings. Then all of a sudden, and the word police come. And they arrest him. Look, he's in there going, ah! And there they are. It ain't over to the fat lady sing fat, body shaming, lady sexist. Sing Italian opera reference, probably racist. <laughs> then all of a sudden, where they send him? They send him to the dessert oppression, of a professional ostracism. He has to go to re-education camp. You know, because he used such horrific words. So that's what the comic writer first wrote. And then, uh-oh, okay, take two, Pearl's comic, click. Then he goes on, hey, my team is down in the ninth. I am accepting all the world's wondrous diversity. <laughs> Wham! Humor approved by the word police. Interesting if even the comics are picking up what's going on in our society. It doesn't just end there. Take a look at this next one right here. Absolutely crazy. In fact, that's kind of big enough. You guys can see it like that, huh? Yeah, yeah. Okay. So, hey, did you know that some squirrels can fly? First class or coach? No. <laughs> Seriously. Some squirrels can fly, but not the ones around here. Right. The ones around here use tiny squirrel cars to get around. <laughs> no. They glide from tree to tree. Look it up. No need to look it up. You said something that contradicts my beliefs, so what you said can't be possibly true. What? Twisted logic. Nobody thinks like that. Been living under a rock lately, have you? I mean, even the comics are recognizing that our world is saying, don't confuse me with the facts. I witness to people all the time. Oh, the Bible's been changed so many times. How do you know it even says what it really says? Well, it's funny you should bring that up because did you know that there's actually 26,000 handwritten Greek manuscripts? That actually the earliest ones predate 30 years within the first time of it written in the, in the apartments of John. And the fact that we have these 26,000, did you know that it wasn't copied from this language to that language and then finally into Latin and then finally into English? That when we go to school, we actually go to cemetery, I mean seminary, to <laughs> learn Greek and Hebrew so that I read every single weekend the text in Greek and in Hebrew and sometimes even in Coptic and sometimes in Aramaic. So I'm getting the original languages before I take it to the people. We have these exact words. Well, I don't know about that. <laughs> All I know is that the Bibles that you guys are preaching is not the thing that was just said. Did you not just hear what I said? Don't confuse me with the facts because what you're saying is in conflict with my belief system. My belief system is what comes first and foremost. Your facts, if they fit in, I will allow them into my life. Family, how does this happen? The Bible says in the last days he will give them over to a depraved mind. Pay attention. Pay attention. And so today I'm admitting that it's a hard time to share the gospel. But folks, can we get a little bit of perspective if we want to go so far as using the word that we're being persecuted? 
See, I was just in Greece, as you know, about three weeks ago, and there you see, very top right there, one of the temples to Athena, the huge goddess right there, all that was there, the backdrop of the, the gods of the day, the gods of pleasure, and so if they did not want to worship the gods of, of sex, basically drugs and rock and roll, then this is where they ended up, with the lions coming out, documented fact, Fox's Book of Martyrs, they would sit in a circle, they would sing praise songs, they would hold one another as the lions ate them to death. But Christians, I gotta let you know that Christian persecution is not just something of history. Just last year, we remember in Egypt, these Coptic Christians here, their lives were taken because they would not convert to Islam. But they said, Jesus is Lord. And every one of them, and the list goes on, it's a long picture, died on that beach because they had one confession and that was Jesus is Lord. Again, what I wanna bring us to here today is this. There are people today who are standing up to raised guns and raised swords screaming, Hail Allah, Allah Akbar is the word they actually say. And they're standing up and are we cowering to raised eyebrows? You see, here is Paul in this scenario where they're coming after him and they're attacking him. And he says, well, you know what? Of all the things they're saying, here's one thing I am guilty of. I am a follower of the way. Amen? Because that's what I am. Folks, can you be reminded that in 2 Timothy 1, God says, for God has not given us a spirit of what? Okay, he hasn't given me that spirit of fear of timidity, but of what? of power and love and discipline. And so when you find yourself in a circumstance and fear is the factor that you are feeling, then you need to recognize I'm not going to the God source right now. It's Lord, help me. And let me tell you, I know what I'm talking about. I'm not the guy that just goes, oh, give me a chance to preach to them all every day, Lord. No. I'm paddling out. I see guys this and I'm like, okay, Lord, is now the time? Is this the opportunity? Do you want to make an opportunity? Do you want to bring a chance here? I recognize that sometimes there's intimidation, but then I say, because I want to do it in my own, then I'm intimidated. If I know I'm being called when God guides, God. Okay, 2 Corinthians 10, 4. The weapons of our warfare are not of the flesh, but divinely what? Powerful for the destruction of fortresses. We're either going to say, I believe in the God and the things that God says, or we're just getting free food on Saturdays. Or Sunday mornings, we just got a comfortable place to sit in somebody else's air condition. Amen? This is what God says. This is God living his life through his people then and now. See, there are some things that we should be guilty of. Number one, guilty of being a follower of the way. Number two, jot this down, family. I want to be guilty of being a believer in the scriptures. That's what Paul says. Verse 14, follow along with me. Look, put your nose back in the book. But this I admit to you, that according to the way that which they call a sect, I do serve the God of our fathers. Notice, believing, what does it say? Everything that is in accordance with the law and that is written in the prophets. I love how Paul says, believing everything that is in accordance to God's word, will, and? So I guess the question is, is what about us here today? What about us? Because here's the facts. The facts are what we do is what we believe. What we do is what we believe. As a surfer, this is no clearer to me than when the surf gets big. Because when the surf gets really big, there's some guys on the beach, other guys out on the lineup. Do you know what I'm talking about? The guys are going, oh, yeah, 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 yeah. And then they're like, why don't you go out right now? Oh, oh, oh um, I'm waiting for my friend. <laughs> like, oh, ah, oh, my leg, I just pulled my muscle, my muscle, I just pulled my muscle. <laughs> and in the same way, what you do is what you believe. And he says, hey, I believe everything. Do we believe what we're going to read here today in God's word? That God is thoroughly large and? And that God had a reason for Paul being where he was to speak to who he was. See, are we guilty of having such faith that we, number three, believe in the resurrection? 
See, here's Paul. He actually believes in the resurrection. Look at verse 15. He says, I believe in everything that the prophet says, and I love this, having a hope in God, which these men cherish themselves, that there shall certainly be a resurrection of both the righteous and the what? Okay. What does Paul have because he believes in the resurrection? What does it say there? Hope. Please connect that. Underline that, circle that, draw an arrow, whatever you need to do. In this rash of suicides that you and I are living in, we spoke about the celebrities this year, the Andy Bourdain, Andy Bourdain, Bourdain, Kate Spade, the list goes on. The ones that you know, I know, friends. Hopelessness. Paul said, I have hope. What gave him hope? The size of his church? Uh, what gave him hope? Think about it. He says clearly, I have hope in the resurrection because if Jesus rose from the dead, oh, how do I know that he rose from the dead? Oh yeah, he met me on the road to Damascus. Yes. He said, brother, why are you persecuting me? Not the Lord's people. You're persecuting me. So he says, if Jesus rose from the dead, then I'm going to rise from the dead. So that means dead isn't dead. So the worst they can do to me isn't the worst. It's just the launching pad to making my life better. That's called hope. Amen? Now think about that. That hope, that promise of living your life in that way. Remember that story I told you about years and years ago that I heard from the missionary in India of that true story about that prince who came through who was known for his benevolence and the beggar sees that and comes out and says alms for the poor and he holds out his bowl, alms for the poor. He has this, his little wooden bowl that has his rice in it and the prince gets down and remember and he comes right up to him and says, hey, may I have a grain of rice? And the prince, and the, and the beggar's kind of like, wait, I'm asking for you, and he's embarrassed, so he just puts it out, and the prince reaches in and grabs one grain of rice and turns around to walk away. And now the guy's like, alms for the poor, alms for the poor, I'm the poor. And so the prince stops, he turns around, and walks right up to him. Again, everyone's watching this. And he says, man, I have another grain of rice. And totally in shock, not knowing what to do, the beggar just holds his bowl out. Prince reaches in and grabs another grain of rice. And now he's walking back to his elephant, literally has one foot, as the missionary is telling the story, on the elephant's leg as it's about to lift him. And now he's angry. He's embarrassed and he's angry, the beggar is. And he says, alms for the poor. I heard you give to the poor. I am the poor. I'm asking for alms. And the prince very gently taps the side of the elephant, comes down and walks right up to him and gets this close and says, may I have one more grain of rice? In disgust, he just puts his hand like this and the prince reaches in and then the beggar throws his bowl on the ground to hear clank, giddy, clank, clank. And he looked down and he saw three gold nuggets where one nugget would be enough to feed him that entire year. And he realized that every single time that prince was asking for a grain, he was replacing it with a nugget. And out loud to my missionary friend, he said, if I had known that's what he was doing, I would have given him every grain I had. And my buddy said, that'll preach. We're grumbling about the grain of rice. Have we any idea what God is doing and replacing, that's hope. Paul said, whatever men can do to me, it's not worse than what God has in store for me. Hallelujah, what a glorious thing that it is. And so, listen, when you have hope in the resurrection, you have hope that you're gonna be with him in the resurrection, that gives you such hope. Listen, the difference between Paul and those guys in the room, remember those Pharisees? They believed that resurrection could happen, Paul believed it did happen. So today, the amount of hope in your life, the amount of fear in your life is going to be directly connected to, listen to me, beloved, on whether or not you believe that it could have happened or whether you believe today that it did happen. Well, yeah, Jesus could have rose from the dead. Or do you believe that I know? 
I know that he lives. I loved it when that reporter got in Billy Graham's face. How do you know God is alive? Well, we've been talking all morning. <laughs> How about us? Next, fourth thing I want to know, are we guilty of tonight? Are we guilty this day of being faultless? Faultless. Now, of course, none of us is sinless. But notice of these charges, Paul says. I said, if we're living our lives right, serving the Lord, not man. Notice verse 20. He says, or else these men themselves tell what misdeed they found when I stood before the council. My point is, he says, there's no witnesses to accuse me because there was no crime. See, are we living our lives in such a way, and I'm going to tell you why in a moment, so stick with me why this is so important. I'm not talking about being holy rollers for holy rollers' sake to high in piety and look down on others and call them whatever and be sin sniffers. Uh Uh-uh. That's what these Pharisees were doing, and they were missing it. Paul is saying something here. Listen, these guys made all these accusations, but Felix, have you heard any facts? Has there anyone here to stand in front of me and tell you exactly what I did wrong? See, there is no crime that is being mentioned. Paul brings this clearly to Felix's attention. But I have an insight for you and me. As much as there were no witnesses against Paul, do you find it also interesting that there were no witnesses there for Paul? Where were his homies? Where were the people that were there with him? Where was James and the guys who said, yeah, this is what we want you to do. Shave your head and do all this different stuff. Why was Paul down? The other guys found the time to get down there five days later, the Caesarea and talk. Where were those backing him up? And in the day of accusations, guys, I just want to go on record and publicly praise God for ministries like ADF, Alliance Defending Freedom. Because for some of you who don't know, most of you who do know, Almost seven years ago, we got slapped with a lawsuit, slapped, boom, came right in the middle of a day in the office, a big fat, literally fatter than a ream of paper by the atheist group that says, you guys can't be meeting in schools, this is wrong, it's illegal, it's collusion, separation of church and state, so on and so forth, and this thing has gone to the Supreme Court, now it's been kicked back out and has to go in towards trial and depositions, and let me tell you what, I learned, I went to seminary to learn how to minister to sheep, not stand in front of wolves. But Alliance Defending Freedom, this group, they're with us all the way through, all seven years. And whenever they call me and say, this is what we're going to do, this is what we're going to do, this is what we're going to do, I just say, praise God. So So here's the thing. Felix sees all this bantering and recognizes this is a religious matter. This is not a civil matter. So he just stalls. He goes, well, you know what, let me just wait for the commander to come down. So he says, let's get Lysias over. Now join me at verse 24. Let's pick up now what happens. They make these falsities, blah, blah, blah. Verse 24. But some days later, this is where it gets interesting, church. Felix arrived with Drusilla, his wife, who was a Jewess, and sent for Paul and heard him speak about, what does it say? Faith in Christ Jesus, verse 25. And as he was discussing righteousness, self-control, and judgment to come, Felix became what? Nervous. Frightened. Yours says nervous. Keep frightened. And it says this. Go away for the present. And when I find time, I will summon you. And at the same time, too, he was hoping that money would be given to him by Paul. Therefore, he also used to send for him quite often to converse with him. Now, let me tell you something here. Who is Drusilla? This wife of Felix, she was, check this out, look overhead. She was the daughter of Herod Agrippa, the one who ordered James beheaded. She was the great-granddaughter of Herod the Great, who ordered the slaughter of all the babies in Bethlehem. She was the great-niece of Herod, who beheaded John the Baptist. She herself was once married to a Syrian prince, but a sorcerer, who she did not know was secretly employed by Felix, told her she needed to divorce her husband and marry Felix. And so because she was so in enamored by the cults at 19 years old, she did this. Now, who's Felix? The craziest thing about this governor, Felix, he was a former slave. 
But because of corruption and dirty deeds done in the back and on the low, low, some people think he might have even taken somebody out for a higher official who then awarded him with this next thing because his own brother was friends with Nero. He now is finding himself as the governor. But he was a man who was known for his hatred. Life has hurt me and been harsh on me, so I will be harsh on everybody else. My point, this woman who has caught a pedigree of violent and crazy non-thinking murders and this angry man, this is the audience that Paul has in front of him. And what does Paul talk about? Does he talk about his journeys, his trials, his persecutions, his victories, the surf, the weather, his clothes? No. What does the Bible say he spoke about? Faith in Jesus Christ. Then read on. What's the next thing? Righteousness. He's beginning to talk about faith in Jesus Christ. And you know what it looks like? He starts talking about with these two completely immoral, corrupt individuals, he starts talking about righteousness. Now, what kind of things would Paul be saying about righteousness? Well, these are things that we know Paul taught. I assume he could have said them there as well. 2 Corinthians 5, 17. Therefore, if anyone is in Christ, they are a new creature. Old things pass away. Behold, all things what? Yeah, new things have come and things become new. So he starts talking about a work, a transformation. Romans 8, you know it. There is now no condemnation for those who are what? In Christ. So he starts talking about this work that God does. Hey, I was once an assassin. I was on my way to Damascus to kill people and God got a hold of me. Then it says he's talked about not just righteousness, but self-control to this crazy wild audience that you would think he would not want to talk about self-control. Romans 7, 5. For while we were in the flesh, the sinful passions which were aroused by the law were at work in the members of our body to bear fruit for death. Meaning, when we just live for the now and we live for the us, it's going to bear nothing but eternal and physical death. He begins to speak about what it means to not live your life in self-control. And then, Paul brings it all the way to the home run, judgment to come. He says that the righteousness in mean, judgment and resurrection for the wicked and the righteous. In Romans 6, 23, Paul probably very likely said, for the wages of sin is what? Death. It's death, but the free gift of God is eternal life in Christ Jesus our Lord. Or in Romans 8 and 6, he begins to say, for the mind of the... For the mind is set on the flesh is death, but the mind set on the spirit is life and peace because the mind set on the flesh is hostile towards God for it does not subject itself to the law of God for it's not even able to do so. I love this. Verse eight, and those who are in the flesh, what does it say? Cannot please God. Cannot please God. Is it any wonder that it says in the next line, and Felix became frightened. Are we trying to make friends or make the way clear to salvation? But I think you need to see this with me. You see, Felix becomes frightened. That word there, that Greek word, literally means shaking like in an earthquake. He's hearing about consequences, about a holiness, a God and living your own way is going to lead this way. But God wants to offer you a change. God wants to change your life. Don't clean up what you're going to do. Come just as you are right now and let God touch your life. The power of the beauty of the message and the conviction was stirring him to the point that he was actually shaking, the Bible says. So what does he do? He blows them off. He says, you know what, go away for now. You know, Paul, I, I think you should just leave right now. See, folks, the devil says that to people all the time. You don't need to respond to your convictions just now. Let's just sleep on it. Maybe next week might be better. I'm talking to somebody here today, and God is stirring within you. are like, you know what, what this guy is saying, and the Holy Spirit is piercing my heart, but you know, what about this and what about that? I need to get more answers, and I'll tell you what. It's one of the devil's favorite lies. There's no hurry. He's not going to tell you there's no God. <laughs> Did you see the sun rise the other morning? Yes, 20-somethings, it does rise as well. It's pretty cool. So, sunrise is just as beautiful as sunsets. You look where we live. You see the hand. There, there's no God. No, no, no. Brah, I can I tell there's a God. Oh, well, then there's no hell. Really? 
All I have to do is turn on the news and see that ain't true. But people will listen to that there's no hurry. Maybe later. My favorite story on this. One of my favorite preachers, D.L. Moody. Sunday evening service, October 8th, 1871. He was beginning the week-long crusade, and he was the kickoff evening of this week-long crusade. And D.L. Moody preached, and the songs went long, and all these things. And so by the time he got up there and he was preaching, he was just recognized that the audience was tired, and he himself was tired. And D.L. Moody says, you know what? I don't have time or the energy tonight to give an invitation. I'll tomorrow, I'll continue to build, and tomorrow night, I'll bring the invitation, and so I won't make that opportunity. And this evangelist, who always at every crusade would do so, that night he said, I'm not going to do an invitation. I'll do it tomorrow night. And if you know the date that I just mentioned, just three hours later, this is what Chicago looked like. And four days later, it burned for three days, folks. There's where he was preaching. And many of the people who were in that church that night died in that fire. And D.L. Moody said, never, never again will I preach and not give an invitation. And I'll tell you what, that pierced this young pastor when I was young. <laughs> and I have had sermons on like Galatians that were 100% tithing messages. And I'm at the end of this message going, this is the last, I mean, you, you, the whole message was on this. Not what you give to God, what God gives to you and all this and in stewardship and all this. There is nothing about the cross and salvation. And I just want to end that thing and send you guys out. And the Holy Spirit says, deal, move day. <laughs> and I have said, and by the way, if today you recognize we're talking about giving this, but if you're not giving your life to Jesus Christ, I remember one day I fought with Jesus right here behind this very pulpit. I don't know, and he just went, deal, move day. <laughs> And just to spank me, I threw out that invitation and five people got saved. Yeah. I'll preach a message on the cross in Calvary and I'm like, oh, there's gonna be wailings and gnashings and, and then no, nobody responds. <laughs> Tithing message, I wanna get saved. <laughs> Jesus all, it ain't about you, home slice. Okay, thank you. <laughs> Amen? Amen? See folks, the when I find time argument, whether that's you here today on getting my life right with God, or whether that's you about sharing the gospel or living such a way, when I find time, here I have an interesting thing. You guys know what the statistics on death are? 10 out of 10 people what? Die, yeah. Yeah, you know? And so with the 100% death rate, it's amazing that we spend such little time contemplating it. When there's few things in life, Garen's ball barons, and that's one of them. The, oh, I'll call you. Can I just tell you right now, God is calling you. Amen. He is calling you. Look at verse 26. Not only does he get this fear factor and says, you know what, just kind of go away. But then at the same time, too. He was hoping that money would be given to him by Paul. Therefore, he also used to send for him quite often and converse with him. Isn't it interesting that he goes from shaking conviction to embezzlement in no time? Yeah. Isn't it crazy how when that Holy Spirit comes and begins to speak, and as soon as you listen to that lie of the enemy, you just allow that foothold in, then the whole power of the flesh comes over, and then all of a sudden you're critical and you're judging the people around you. Yeah, you know, maybe I shouldn't have. I don't know these people, they're all hypocrites. I'm not, not going to let myself know who do you, I don't know who do you. And all of a sudden, we just go back to the flesh monster like that. That's exactly what I see going on here with Felix. That window of conviction. How quick. And you know, I've got to share something with all of you here today. Here's an FYI. Some of your friends that you've been witnessing to are hoping you're gonna to fall too. Because then there's no truth in what you preach. And so they're just saying, yeah, you know, look at him now, look at Tony, he's all, yeah, but you know what, he'll be back in six months. 
clean and sober now, but we'll see him back here, sock him up, six months, you watch. Because they're hoping that there's no truth in what you say. And here's my whammy. Please let me say this in love. And every time that we do, we are putting another nail in their coffin. I'll tell you why. Most of the time, I don't do stupid. Because how it's going to affect you. You are the reason that keeps me from being stupider than I am. You're welcome. <laughs> I can't imagine having to come up in front of you guys and saying, oh yeah, I gotta resign because I did da 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 da. Don't do it. I ain't gonna. <laughs> you understand what I'm saying? Amen. When you love others more, cause come on, if you're gonna go to the gym at six in the morning or five in the morning, do you really go? That room is so silent, I love it. <laughs> Oh yeah, tomorrow, 5 a.m., I'm gonna go to the gym. Eh, eh, eh. Eh, eh, eh. Eh, eh, eh. But if you know you have to meet your friend there at 5 a.m., do you go? Interesting. Paul said, I'm gonna choose righteously because Felix needs Jesus. Living right for us, the enemy will make it seem tiresome. But living right so that you'll have a platform to preach, it always is just sweet as honey. Because when it comes time to preach, all you got to do is preach. Hmm. Should I do my devotions in the morning or should I do my devotions at night? Yes. Tell you what, yeah, the answer is yes. <laughs> And what I found is if you do your devotions in the morning, you have, the less, you have less to ask forgiveness for in the night. Amen. Yes. Yes. Amen. Amen. Listen. I also want to say this. The opposite is true. There are also some people around you and they've seen your life change and they are deeply, desperately hoping that you don't fall because they want to know there is truth. Live right to honor God and to be a vehicle for him to bless others. i got to close this thing. Let's go to verse 27 here. It says this, But after two years had passed, Felix was succeeded by Portius Festus. Wishing to do the Jews a favor, Felix left Paul in prison. What's my point? Felix is like going, yeah, maybe I'll hear from you. I get conviction, and then he blows it off. Then he starts looking for himself. Well, guess what happened just two years later? Two years later, Felix was removed in shame, disciplined. His wife, Drusilla, just happens to go to this place, you ready, called Mount Vesuvius to go shopping. If you know your history, what happened? Pompeii, boom, she died there. Both of these people had a chance to receive the gospel. Both of them died and spend eternity apart from God. And folks, I'm gonna tell you something. Just like Felix, all of us here as Christians, we can start feeling convicted too the first time. We're doing something and compromising the Holy Spirit brings in, oh, you feel this conviction the first time, but then we go back and listen as the dog returns to the vomit, and somehow the last time it's not as convicting, and then the third time, not so bad, and pretty soon you're like, well, you know, it's no big deal. You know, it's not really that bad. You know, well, Jesus forgives me, you know, because God is love. If that is you here today. Can I be loving enough to say, watch out? Amen. Because this is God's love and word for you. Hebrews 10, 26. For if we go on sinning willfully after receiving the knowledge of truth, there no longer remains a sacrifice for sins. Another one of those verses I don't often see quilted on a pillow in Christian bookstores. Is that verse saying you lose your salvation? No. What it's saying is that if you have it, then you don't continue to go to stupid. You have one Lord today. Who is it? Who's calling the shots? And if you continue to go back and back and back and back, 
then you are God, not Jehovah. He says, there isn't, the sacrifice is there, but if you're under it, then great. But if you're walking out, then you never really stayed in there. Those who went out from us to show they were not of us, because if they were of us, they would have remained, it says in 1 James 2, or in 1 John 2, 19. There is the promise of God. So if that is you here today, and God stirred you up when I read that verse, then look overhead as well, because this is also what you need to know. In the same chapter, in chapter 10, he said, let us draw near with a sincere heart in full assurance of what? Faith, having our hearts sprinkled clean from an evil conscience and our bodies washed with what? <sighs> what did the writer of Hebrews say? That all of us here every day need to come to Calvary. And listen, both Friday and Sunday. We need to go to Calvary on Friday because that's where he died for our sins because our sins put him on that cross, amen? But then we need to make sure we don't just leave him on that cross and we come back on Sunday recognizing that he is risen. And if there is resurrection in Jesus, there is resurrection in us and we have an eternity promised with him. Hallelujah. Hey, thank you for spending your time with us today at One Love Ministries and being a part of our program. But this invitation that you heard today through the word of God is directly to you. And I want you to know if you have not yet made a profession of faith, meaning ask Jesus Christ to be your Lord and Savior, that invitation is available to you right now. Change, transformation, all the glorious things that God wants to do are available to you, but you gotta ask. You must personally invite Jesus Christ to be your Lord and Savior. So if God has been speaking to you during this message, your heart's been beating, your hands been cutting kind of sweaty, you've been wrestling with things, guess what? That's the Lord knocking on your heart. And I wanna lead you right now in a prayer that could allow you to invite Jesus Christ to become your Lord and Savior and open the door for eternity for you and Him to be together. I want you to pray with me right now. It's not a magic prayer, but an honest heart that will invite the Lord into your life. Join me right now. Dear Jesus, thank you for dying on the cross for my sin. I ask you to forgive me and to become my Lord and Savior. Today, Jesus, I believe that you are God and that you saved me and my faith will be put in you. Please give me your Holy Spirit to come in and upon me that I might learn how to live as a child of God. Thank you, Jesus, for your love. And today I come home. In your name I pray, amen. If you prayed that prayer with us, we are excited. The Bible says the angels in heaven are rejoicing and we want to join them too. So would you call this number right here on the bottom of the screen and let us know. We want to help you find a church that's in your area. Get plugged in, get fellowship, get disciple as the Bible says because we want to grow in God's grace together. God bless you. He loves you. We're excited. If you would like to receive a copy of today's message, please write down the sermon number on your screen and give us a call at 955-9335. For service times and locations, check us out on the web at onelove.org. Mahalo for watching.